So good evening. My name is Eric Carpia. I'm with History Colorado. I'm here with tonight's featured guest speaker, Dr. Majel Boxer. Tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by History Colorado Community Museums, El Pueblo History Museum, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, the Trinidad History Museum, and also the Ute Indian Museum. Before we begin tonight's program, in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of the series. If you'd like to join in support of our Borderlands project, we invite you to support the initiative by contributing to our Borderlands project at coloradogives.org. And we'll drop the link in the chat box um, later this evening. As you all know, um, our Borderlands series is offered on a donation basis only, so your support will allow us to continue and expand on events like tonight's. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's featured guest, Dr. Majel Boxer. Dr. Boxer is an associate professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at Fort Lewis College in Durango, Colorado. Dr. Boxer, welcome. We're excited to have you here this evening. Oh, I believe you're on mute. Thank you, Eric. Thanks for the warm welcome. Let me first begin by um, gearing up my screen for the presentation tonight. Um, my talk tonight um, was uh, brought together through the efforts of Eric Carpio and those working behind the screens. And so I wanna give a thank you for the opportunity to present my work tonight. Um, my name is Dr. Majel Boxer, and I am an enrolled member of the Fort Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Tribes of Montana. I also would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Fort Lewis Indian School, located first at Pagosa Springs and then uh, Hesperus, Colorado, and also its current uh, campus in Durango, Colorado, sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo peoples including their ancestors whose homelands encompass present-day Southwest Colorado. I'd like to also acknowledge the Ute peoples whose creation placed them amongst the mountains. I'd also like to acknowledge the Dene people whose emergence centered them amongst the sacred mountains, including Debednitsa, big mountain sheep in the north, uh, what we know today as Mount Hesperus. Um, my comments tonight and my work is situated on the concept of the absent presence. And I cite the work of Myla Vicente Carpio. Uh, she explains, indigenous history is the absent presence in American history, deliberately erased or radically transformed to maintain the master narrative. The process of colonization have created this absence in the American historical memory, which shapes how indigenous history, space, or place have been and continue to be renamed, redefined, and destroyed. I think of this concept whenever I enter campus um, from the front hill, and I'm greeted by the sign that you see in front of you, where it says, Fort Lewis College was founded in 1911. For me, uh, Fort Lewis Indian School history and then indigenous student experiences while at school is erased when the college um, notes that its founding date as 1911. When I know that the college um, that uh, Fort Lewis Indian School existed prior to the college and was established in 1892. I first began um, with giving a context that there existed the federal Indian policy of assimilation and the height of this policy of, of assimilation was between the years 1880s and through the 1920s. 
At this time, the self-proclaimed Friends of the Indian uh, had a goal. Their goal was to assimilate indigenous peoples into mainstream American society. Their hope was to solve the Indian problem, to find a way to finally put an end to this problem that plagued uh, the United States for several centuries uh, since the founding and even before the uh, the United States was a nation. These Friends of the Indian promoted two policies. The first was the removal of Indian children to boarding schools, and I'll focus my comments tonight on that. But I also want us to be aware of allotment, that the Friends of the Indian, these reformers from the East, thought that the best way to uh, compel Native people to assimilate was to uh, break up their reservation homelands. Uh, these reservation homelands were already uh, vestiges of traditional homelands. And so the breakup of these lands um, was meant for native people to uh, see the land as private property, to transform their labor so that they would become farmers and that uh, they would, through generations, assimilate and uh, be part of the body politic. This was accomplished through the passage of the General Allotment Act. Um, here, just to give you a brief uh, overview, uh, Fort Lewis Indian School is part of uh, nearly two dozen off-reservation boarding schools. The first was Carlisle Indian Industrial School, in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, that was established in 1879. And then Fort Lewis, uh, somewhere in the middle of this list on the bottom, Fort Lewis Indian School opened its doors in 1892. And uh, several more uh, off reservation boarding schools would begin operations um, during this period of time. Geographically, Fort Lewis Indian School, of course, is located uh, in southwest Colorado, but this map here details the number of off or non-reservation boarding schools. Uh, Carlisle over in Pennsylvania being the first of these schools and then several um, others to follow as we saw. Uh, many of these off-reservation boarding schools had the goal of um, taking in Native students, but doing so uh, at a far distance from their homelands. Uh, for many of those behind federal Indian schools, the hope was that the children would, uh, would never return, that they would spend the entire school term at boarding school. And then in the summer months that they would participate in what was called the outing program. And so for many superintendents, many of those Eastern reformers they had hoped that this would be the final push for Native people to become fully assimilated through the education of their children. By the numbers, um, this annual report of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs uh, noted the increase of the number of students attending some type of boarding school, whether that was federal or church-run boarding school, and also whether that was a day school. Um, re early records uh, were not as uh, well kept, and so the attendance in 1877 amongst the first wave of students numbered 35, uh, just over 3,500 students. By 1900, over 21,000 students would be enrolled in some type of uh, uh, school whether it was a day school or boarding school, uh, we could see that there were some differences between those two. This brings me to the, uh, a brief overview of Fort Lewis Indian School. Um, it's important to note that Fort Lewis was a US Army post, uh, first located at Pagosa Springs in 1878. And then it relocated several miles west of Pagosa to the town of Hesperus in 1880. The Army post would be decommissioned. And then in 1892, 
Fort Lewis Indian School began its operations. Um, there is one thing I wanted to note is that um, uh, part of my talk uh, comes from the records that are kept in the Center of Southwest Studies and also records at the National Archives. So my primary documentation uh, comes from the years 1904 and 1905. And at this time, the superintendent was William W. Peterson. At all times in my research, I wanted to include the names of students so that their presence uh, isn't erased. And whenever possible, I include um, their experiences and their names in my comments. Record keeping was pretty spotty for Fort Lewis Indian School. If you'll notice that in 1901 and 1902, and also in 1908, that there were no attendance reports kept. Now that's not to suggest that uh, no attendance was taken, but that these records did not survive and that, they, um, um, that there is no information from those years. In a letter from the U.S. Indian Inspector C.C. Duncan to the Secretary of the Interior, he wrote, this school is organized March 1892 has not been the present and has not to the present time been a success. But the school has been small and now contains only 128 pupils and 41 of these have been transferred from the Santa Fe school and if returned upon the opening of that school, will leave the Fort Lewis school with but 87 pupils. It seems to me that this school could be supplied with scholars from the Southern Utes. And I think there are at least 150 children of that tribe of school age, a large proportion of whom could be brought into that school. He also continues that he uh, would be authorized to use some compulsion to compel the attendance of children of this tribe. Um, he's speaking of the Southern Ute. He finally writes, most of the children in attendance being in the or order named from the Mescalero Apaches, Hickorya Apaches, White Mountain Apaches, San Carlos Apaches, Papagos, Pimas, here he uses the word diggers, which is a derogatory word um, in describing California native people, Navajos and Utes. There being no school on the reservation, it occurs to me that the rule of preventing the removal of Indian children from the reservation should be relaxed. And these children given the benefit of an education by being forced into the Fort Lewis school. There are countless times where the uh, a superintendent of Fort Lewis Indian School writes about compelling or uh, enforcing or even coercing uh, Native parents, especially Southern Ute parents, to send their children to school. The Indian inspector also continued to say, I recommend that at least 50 of the brightest children of the Southern Utes be taken without the consent of their parents and placed in the Fort Lewis school. I organized the rest of my talk then into several themes based on the, the type of information I was able to uncover about uh, indigenous students at school. The themes I will talk on are the themes of school life, well-being, the denigration of spiritual and cultural practices, guardianship and paternalism, and then finally, parent and child relationships. It's no mistake that Fort Lewis Indian School was patterned after a military school. Um, of course, it came um, and used the buildings that were part of Fort Lewis um, Army Post, but the school day itself was uh, highly regimented. Um, the superintendent, William Peterson, wrote to the assistant matron of the small boys that uh, these small boys were to have roll calls as follows. So roll call beginning at 6.25 a.m., another roll call at 7.20, 8.20, 11.55, 12.50, 
110 and a final roll call at 525. The superintendent said that roll call was for each company before bedtime and inspection of beds after all have retired. Any unexcused or unaccounted for child um, would be reported to the industrial teacher. Part of the original architect behind federal uh, off-reservation boarding schools was Captain Richard Henry Pratt. Uh, Pratt was a military man himself. He served during the Civil War and he even oversaw the imprisonment of 74 Cheyenne and Kiowa prisoners um, at uh, Fort Marion in St. Augustine. And so Pratt was that uh, architect behind Federal Indian Boarding School. And because of that, he really implemented that military lifestyle uh, in the lives of school children. Fort Lewis Indian School was well regarded for its large uh, marching uh, area in front of the schools. And also that school age children would be marched up and down those lawns uh, regularly. The curriculum at the school was devoted to English along with math. Uh, superintendent Peterson would write to Estelle Real, who served as the superintendent of all Indian schools. Uh, Peterson wrote to her and stated, in teaching the Indian children to speak English, and I assure you, you will have my cooperation of this school. Peterson would also uh, request that um, uh, children be instructed to sing what he called the national airs and also to play instruments. And so Fort Lewis Indian School had a marching band. Uh, Peterson requested that band sheet music as above um, and he laid out music for the cornet, clarinet, uh, tenor clarinet, alto, et cetera. Um, to include the Star Spangled Banner, America, the Red, White, and Blue, Dixie, and then a song called Hail Columbia. So not only was the daily uh, school regiment uh, highly militarized, but one that uh, promoted English, uh, speaking of English, reading and writing in English. And then alongside their curriculum, uh, students were supposed to engage in the vocational training, and that included farming and gardening. Peterson would write, uh, I wish to say that every effort is being made to have the farm idea permeate the schoolroom work to as a great an extent as possible. A number work and language work are based upon the subject as far as practical and regular instruction is given using Goff and Main's text. This textbook, Goff and Main, um, was titled First Principles of Agriculture. Peterson promoted the idea of school gardens. He wanted school gardens to be made by all the primary pupils under the direction of the primary teacher, and the girls will have their individual plots under the charge of the girls' matron attendance will be given to the proper instruction concerning the plants and their growth, and an earnest effort will be made to have each garden produce results. In addition to school work, uh, children also would face uh, illness and um, the spread of disease and things even such as lice amongst themselves. Illnesses that plagued Indian school um, was noted by William Peterson. He noted that a very small, thin little boy was brought into school last fall by, an am by a man who gave his name as Nakide Nanez and who said his home was in the village. Um, the boy is not at all well. He is not sick in bed, but he is very listless, and he can't be roused up to anything if they want to take him home. I shall be glad to have them do so. Peterson also noted that Shay Lily B and a little girl from the two Gray Hills area have had pneumonia. Shay is well, and I think the other girl will be soon. 
Annie Antonio is a little sick, but not much. She will sit up tomorrow. When I looked at these comments made by Peterson, especially the son of Naki Denonez, where uh, he showed signs of listlessness, um, for me, it goes back to that sense of well being that it's not enough that um, the school had a physician on hand to treat sick children, but that children also had to thrive while at school, and that many, um, and some of them, uh, did not thrive. Um, because of the close living arrangements, uh, the dormitories that young girls and boys were, uh, were assigned into, uh, the spread of lice did occur amongst young children. Uh, Peterson again uh, had his attention called to the issue. He writes, my attention was called this afternoon to the condition in which the little girls' heads were found. Um, you will at once see personally that the small girls' heads are made clean and that they are kept so. And since the heads of the little girls with short hair were found to be in the worst condition, it is evident that hair cutting is not a remedy. And for that reason, no more girls will have their hair so cut. He made a final recommendation that weekly inspections and fine combs um, are to be re uh, requisitioned. I find it interesting that for Peterson, uh, he did not at all once mention lice. Um, he also um, did see that hair cutting did not save young girls and even boys from uh, contracting lice and spreading lice from amongst each other. Um, so for him, his recommendation that little girls hair not be cut um, was based on that assumption that it didn't help the spread. For me, I'm, I was concerned on why um, cultural practices and the cultural notions of long hair were not also part of that consideration. But for Peterson, it was a health issue. There's another story regarding the health of Laura Pete, um, the daughter of Sosin Bega. Uh, here, Peterson writes that, um, that she has gone down very rapidly and that he wanted word of her illness to go, to, uh, word to go to her father. Peterson says, it seems impossible to find out what is the matter with her. In some respects, her trouble resembles tuberculosis and other respects, not at all. Our physician who has given her every attention is unable to decide. There is no doubt, however, but that her trouble was aggravated by their singing over her last summer, as she has never been uh, really well since her return to the fort. This story tells me that uh, Peterson was concerned definitely about the health of the young girl, but he was also finding that uh, what aggravated her illness, he said, was their singing over her last summer. So to me, this suggests that the cultural practices and spiritual practices that involved uh, native ways of healing, that that was cited as um, aggravating her health condition and not at all um, any other, um, any other uh, explanation for her illness. There are moments where Peterson uh, writes in a derogatory way about native spiritual and cultural practices. That was one example. But unrelated to Fort Lewis Indian students, um, school students, Peterson was asked uh, to identify a ceremonial pipe found in, quote, an Aztec ruin. And so Peterson responded, the youths do not use pipes at all now. And if they did use, uh, once use them, it would not be likely that one would be buried in an Aztec ruin as the living Indians avoid those places as much as possible. Um, for me, uh, there's no sense of understanding cultural and spiritual practices with Peterson that uh, he definitely notes that assimilate assimilation was well underway with Ute peoples um, because he notes that they do not use pipes at all now. 
that's less of an indi um, indication that spiritual practices and cultural practices were waning, but rather when he wrote this in 1904, um, the Indian Crimes Code had already been well established since 1883. And so uh, 20 years uh, plus uh, Native people had been prohibited from practicing their spiritual practices and ceremonies. And so the fact that the Utes did not use pipes is more of a reflection of federal Indian policy that made it a crime to possess ceremonial pipes, um, made it uh, an offense if one were to be found with a medicine bag or if one was found to be a, a medicine man. And finally, Peterson doesn't necessarily understand the reasons why Native people avoid uh, places like these Aztec ruins. Um, for him, um, you know, it suggests maybe some, quote, ba on backward uh, practices. But again, it's the respect Native people have for those places and for the ancestors who lived um, and then left those places. My next theme I wanted to uh, discuss is that of guardianship and paternalism. Of course, guardianship and paternalism characterize the relationship the superintendent had with uh, indigenous pupils at Fort Lewis Indian School, but also guardianship and paternalism extended even over Ute peoples, uh, people who are not at all students of Fort Lewis Indian School. Uh, one of the ways that guardianship manifested itself is that superintendents had uh, an inordinate amount of power in uh, deciding whether or not a student were to stay uh, in school um, and to deny parent requests for their child to be returned. Peterson would write, I will not say that Fermania will not um, uh, let me start again. I will, I will say that Fermania will not say whether she wants to go home or not. In any event, she could not go home before school closes on June 23rd. Here he's writing to a Mr. J.P. Uh, Gallegos at San Luis, Colorado. Peterson continues, I wish to say further that I have been appointed her guardian by the courts of the state and that she will have to remain under my legal charge until she is 18 years of age. Peterson also uh, relates that um, William Spear, a Navajo boy, uh, will be carried as an outing pupil belonging to this school. Even in his language and as he describes this outing program that uh, William Spear belonged to this school. And so children were seen as um, perhaps even like property belonging to a school under the guardianship of the superintendent. William Spear, um, Peterson said, is an excellent boy, industrious and trustworthy and will, I hope, make a good citizen Indian someday. Guardianship and uh, paternalism um, would extend to, um, to whether or not uh, children would, uh, would stay at uh, school. Uh, Peterson says, you know, of course, that it is contrary to the regulations of the Indian office to allow pupils of a non-reservation school to return to their homes before the end of the terms for which they have entered. Of course, from the school standpoint, it is not a good thing for them to go home at all. They forget more in the vacation than they will learn in twice the time they spend at home. To say nothing of their getting so dirty and full of parasites that it is as much work to clean them up as it is when they first come in. I cannot say that our civilization is positively better than theirs in every respect, but it is the kind that is being put upon them more or less by force of necessity, and any step back into the old ways is naturally a hindrance. You know, I, uh, of course, uh, understand Peterson's intent here where um, children are under his guardianship, 
um, that he has the authority to uh, disregard a parent's um, desires to have their child returned even during school breaks. And that overall his attitude of native parents and native homes is that, you know, children return to dirty homes, um, as he said, full of parasites. Of course, um, the whole time, you know, this is a bit um, um, odd of him because schools themselves um, did not um, preclude the spreading of things such as lice, and I, as I just had explained. Um, the superintendent um, of Fort Lewis Indian School um, not only oversaw Indian pupils there, but William Peterson actually had a superintendent authority over uh, Ute peoples as well. In 1905, Peterson clarified um, regarding the Utes allo allotted along the Animas and La Plata rivers, said Indians having been placed under the charge of the superintendent of the Fort Lewis School on February 7th, 1904. Um, so Peterson oversaw uh, those uh, allotted Utes and he would write, it seems but reasonable to suppose that it would be better to have the allotted Utes keep by themselves. Allotment is supposed to be for the purpose of getting an Indian to settle down in one place and stay there. This he is not inclined to do and he will become more and more disinclined in proportion to the frequency with which he is thrown into contact with those of his race who are still nomadic. So of course, Peterson advocated for the separation of Southern Ute uh, peoples from their um, relatives, uh, those who resided at Navajo Springs, which is present day Toyak. Peterson would take his role as superintendent of the Navajo Springs Agency very seriously. He even issued a warning to all cattle and sheep owners. Um, these are non-native cattle and sheep owners. He said, you will take notice that all persons found trespassing on Ute allotments or on the Ute reservation will be prosecuted to the full extent of the law in the federal courts. So his role as guardian also meant that he was tasked with protecting the interests of his wards, which wards which included Ute peoples. He also was on the alert for anyone selling liquor to uh, Indians. In 1905, Peterson wrote, anything you can do toward the apprehension and conviction of anyone selling liquor to the Indians will have my fullest support. I should be glad to have you report to me any individual cases of drunkenness that may come that may come under your personal observation, giving names and dates. Uh, policing and uh, runaways were also um, uh, found at Fort Lewis Indian School. Uh, Peterson uh, gave a recommendation of what he said the Indian Sandoval in quotes. He said, I desire to say that I've had perhaps more to do with him than any other of the Navajos and that my dealings with him have been satisfactory. He has kept his word with me as far as been possible for him to do. And he has given me more help in gathering children than has any other Indian. There was another uh, Indian police officer, a man named Akowitz. And uh, uh, Peterson noted that this man, Akowitz, was made a policeman for the Mesa and that the Indian office uh, offered him the position of police captain at an increase of $5 per month in wages. Uh, Peterson stated, I am not going to continue him in that position or any other unless he makes up his mind to put his boy in school and to use his influence to help the school all he can. For me, this really um, helps me understand why uh, indigenous men would participate in the policing of their own communities. Oftentimes, uh, oftentimes the promise of a steady salary, steady employment was a reason why many men would accept the position of police. 
and ones that were tasked with uh, locating and bringing back runaways. There were um, a number of children who ran away from Fort Lewis Indian School. One of those children was a young girl named Bessie Burns, the daughter of a man named Weaselskin. Uh, Peterson noted that Bessie has gone back to school. Um, if she has not done so, I should be very glad to have you send your police after her. She belongs to you and they must be made to understand that they cannot go out of school in the middle of a year or of a term without the consent of the superintendent. I have no police here or I would send her over to you myself. Here, uh, Peterson is writing to uh, uh, Burton B. Custer, who was the superintendent and special dispersing agent in Ignacio. And again, wanting to uh, track down Bessie Burns and to make sure that she was attending school. There was another young uh, Ute boy who was a runaway. Uh, his name was Bill Gunn. And um, Peterson simply states, um, Bill Gunn, an allotted you boy who has been in school here, ran away yesterday. Again, writing to the superintendent at, in Ignacio. If you find him there and will send him over with a policeman, I shall be glad to pay the pri uh, police for bringing the boy. And finally, there's another case of a runaway where the superintendent Peterson just assures uh, Mr. Burt McJunction in a, a Farmington, New Mexico, that he would settle a bill um, that McJunction had um, in his efforts to recover a runaway and to uh, send that child back to Fort Lewis Indian School. One thing that struck me uh, the most were that Parents and children um, uh, did maintain their uh, relationships with each other, that parents never uh, just simply forgot about their child at boarding school, but that parents would write to the superintendent uh, pretty regularly um, and ask for information about their child. And um, uh, Peterson himself would encourage children to write letters uh, to their parents. One of those parents was a man named Fulgesino Lucera from Tierra Amarillo, New Mexico. Um, this father wrote to Peterson and Peterson wrote back to say, um, I will say Leonardo is very well and that I do not know of any reason why he has not written you except that he has neglected it. I will see him and ask him to write at once. The pupils can write once every month or oftener if they desire to do so. This letter was written to Fulgesino Lucero in December of 1904. Several months later in March uh, 1905, Peterson writes again to this father. He writes, concerning your son Leonardo, I wish to say that he is very well and he has been so all winter. He seems to be perfectly contented, but he is like all other boys. He forgets that his father would like to hear from him often. I always let parents, um, this is Peterson, I always let p uh, parents know just as soon as anything in, is the matter with their children. And you may be sure that I shall not let his brother nor anyone else take him away from here. Even though Peterson is as, um, uh, responding to the father, Fulgestino Lucero, um, and you know, keeping him in the loop about how his son is doing and even encouraging his son, Leonardo, to write letters. Um, you know, Peterson can't help himself but to tell the father, uh, uh, Fulgestino, you know, you may be sure that I shall not let his brother nor anyone else take him away from here. Um, so even in his capacity as facilitator uh, between this father and son relationship, um, Peterson still has to say, you know, and exert his guardianship over Leonardo and say, uh, his brother or no, anyone else is not going to take this child from Fort Lewis Indian School. <clears throat> the superintendent um, also promoted the outing program. And again, this outing program was 
a summer program that was meant to take uh, indigenous children who were learning vocational skills at school to place them into the homes of white families. And the hope was that these white families would uh, cement even more so the skills that they were learning in school by uh, uh, having that child be part of their family and their household. <clears throat> Peterson had uh, one such child, a young woman named Annie Yuri, and he said that I want her to place her somewhere where she will have good, careful training. Um, she has been in our house for nearly a year now, but Mrs. Peterson is at work so much of the time that she cannot give her the personal attention that Brill needs. <clears throat> There's another uh, story of a father um, William Welch, who also wanted um, and requested that his daughter be returned to him during summer, and Peterson would say it's not a poss uh, it's not a possibility that um, um, that she will uh, stay on um, and be placed um, in that outing program. Uh, Peterson would note, we have a Navajo girl, 16 or 17 years old, who has been working for Mrs. Abbott in Durango. Under present circumstances, Mrs. Abbott cannot keep her, and I did not know, but Ms. Nolan would like to have her. Um, for me, again, some uh, important re um, reminders that this outing program was meant to keep children um, away from their parents, to uh, train children, and to have them um, become part of the household for these uh, families. Finally, there were some parents who wanted their children to attend Fort Lewis, so it wasn't always compulsory attendance or coercion to get children to school. Um, uh, Peterson would write to a father, a man he simply called Navajo Charlie, and uh, responded that uh, his children were both well and that his children's names were Jose Abel, who had a sore finger, and then Juan Pablo, who had not been sick at all. And he responded, Peterson, I should be very glad to have you leave your boys here all summer. Um, so again, always trying to get children to stay uh, throughout the summers and then facilitate that relationship between parents and their children. The final thing I wanted to mention then is um, on parent and child relationships is that Peterson did not really seem to understand that indigenous family structures are complex, that it would not be unusual for a child to have their mother, but also their aunts, um, um, the mother's sisters be equally viewed as mothers, or again, their father and father's brothers, uh, not just be uncles, but also additional fathers. So I thought it was um, a little lighthearted when um, Peterson um, wrote this. Uh, 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 this was about a young boy named Carl Aloysius. Um, he said, the boy Carl Aloysius, um, and he is sure thin, but it is the hardest thing in the world to get the right fathers for these children, that they have so many fathers, it is very confusing. And the way I understood this and took this was not that um, no one knew the, the, the father of this child or was confused about his parentage, but rather that this child would probably have several adult relatives who were all very much interested in his welfare. And so for Peterson, he simply uh, did not understand, you know, how can these children have this many fathers? Um, who are all of these um, adults of uh, calling in and writing in um, to find out the status of their relative, their young relative. In conclusion, I uh, want to mention that Fort Lewis Indian School did cease operating as an Indian school in 1910. And in that year, uh, uh, the federal government um, in the Indian Pro Appropriations Bill in 1910 um, finally uh, addressed the vacant buildings um, 
and fixtures that were left at Hesperus. So the state of Colorado agreed to uh, accept that land, which was over 6,000 acres and the buildings with this condition. And the condition was that said lands and buildings shall be held and maintained by the state of Colorado as an institute of learning and that Indian pupils shall at all times be admitted to such school free of charge for tuition and on terms of equality with white pupils. Today, the state of Colorado does indeed have a contractual obligation to reimburse Fort Lewis College for the tuition of Native students attending uh, school here. And so this continues to be one of the legacies of this era of Indian boarding schools. So I wanna thank you for listening this evening and I will go ahead and ask if there are any questions and um, also, uh, for those who have questions, give you some time to, to uh, respond. Um, but here is my contact information. My email is boxer underscore m at fortlewis.edu. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or anything that doesn't get addressed, um, please do drop me an email. I also would like to reach out to anyone in the audience who had parent, uh, parents, grandparents, great grandparents who attended Fort Lewis Indian School at any time of its operations, even when it became a public high school and then a junior college. Um, I'm happy to, to follow up with those individuals and learn more about um, those uh, experiences. So let me go ahead and um, stop sharing my screen and then I will uh, turn it back to Eric, I think maybe could help field some of these questions that are um, in the chat. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Boxer. That was wonderful. Um, thank you. We do have a few questions. Um, Christy asks if you can talk about the relationship of, between the Fort Lewis School to the opening of the Southern Ute Boarding School in Ignacio in 1901. So the relationship is interesting. This is one that I want to explore further. Um, Fort Lewis Indian School uh, was considered an off-reservation boarding school, and there was a lot of opposition from the Ute communities to send their children to Fort Lewis Indian School. In fact, one of the reasons why Fort Lewis Indian School had such a diverse Native student population is that it was um, always in constant need for more students to bring up their enrollment numbers to try and maximize the school. Uh, Chief Ignacio um, was very, um, uh, very opposed to Fort Lewis Indian School. Uh, there were times when Peterson would write or mention Ignacio, uh, Chief Ignacio, and also say that, you know, he refuses to uh, 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 send children to Fort Lewis Indian School. And one that was also more puzzling to me that needs further investigation is that um, um, Superintendent Peterson wanted to send some students to uh, Ignacio Day School, but Chief Ignacio said no, that he would not accept those students. So that relationship seems pretty complex, um, that Chief Ignacio was one of the more vocal leaders uh, against sending children to Fort Lewis. Um, and then also uh, he then though did allow students to attend the day school in Ignacio. Um, but it's an area that I want to explore uh, more deeply myself. So we have another question from Lori. Um, Lori says that she's wondering about the tasks which the student were given or quote unquote taught she asked, were traditional Native American roles considered when assigning boys and girls their activities at the school, or did the task conform mostly to white conceptions of gender-related tasks, or were neither considered? Um, thank you for that question, Lori. Um, Fort Lewis uh, was part of the, that uh, bigger industrial vocational school uh, paradigm where the curriculum was set so that it patterned itself after Euro-American uh, divisions of gender, uh, gender divisions of labor rather. And so part of that assimilation was to uh, bring about a cultural change for uh, Native students so that 
women would be confined to the domestic sphere in their labors. Um, that women could though um, a garden and tend to their own little plat. But by and large, it was uh, young boys who were going to uh, transform themselves into that agrarian ideal of being a farmer, providing for uh, your family, being the head of a family. And so most tribal societies have it that the genders are uh, complementary. Uh, if it's patterned after Euro-American uh, concepts of gender, there is that um, embedded hierarchy where um, men were to be the heads of household, um, men would control um, you know, uh, the income for that household. And so women were largely shut out from participating in any type of local economy um, that they would, um, it was expected that they would stay home and raise children and uh, uh, beautify their home as well. And just a reminder to those in the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Boxer, Relaine asked about um, parent letter writing to children and asked whether parents uh, would write to children in their own language or in English. I can only um, partially respond, Raylene. Um, in several instances, um, uh, Peterson writes uh, and explains that it was actually Indian children who worked as interpreters. And so he would, you know, at one times recommend a certain child to do um, uh, work interpreting and then not another one because they weren't as uh, uh, good in interpretation. So to me, that tells me that um, parents uh, were speaking their own native languages, that uh, they relied on interpreters, um, those who, you know, were working at, uh, neighboring towns, you know, who worked with both native and non-native communities, um, but that um, children would write to their parents in English. And then I imagine it was up to those parents then to take their letters to someone to, to read them and to translate them for, uh, to translate the letters for the parents. And so um, uh, native languages, of course, were not being promoted in schools. In fact, um, it was English only in those schools. Dr. Boxer, Stephanie um, indicates that she was, she says she was under the impression that there were four Indian boarding schools in Colorado. Um, would you please clarify? Yeah, I would say, Stephanie, that you are um, correct, that there are um, uh, schools in, uh, there was a school in Grand Junction uh, Ignacio Day School, Fort Lewis Indian School, and I'm um, trying to think of the last school. Um, it'll, have to, it'll, it'll occur to me later, but um, there were several um, boarding schools in Colorado. Uh, Grand Junction and Fort Lewis were the two that were off-reservation, uh, federally run boarding schools um, in the state. And then when both uh, closed operations. Uh, both schools had that same condition um, in the Appropriations Bill of 1910, where um, the state of Colorado acquired the lands that the schools were situated on um, with the condition that those schools, and only Fort Lewis is still in operation, that those schools would accept Native students and that the state would be contractually obligated to reimburse um, the well, for us, um, the institution. Um, Lou asks, uh, if a child was not on the reservation and still attended the school, um, do you happen to know how they were selected to attend? You know, I didn't get the sense that there was any formal recruitment um, process for students, um, but in fact, Peterson and, and even the superintendent before him, Breen, would would write constantly about um, if you you know if you could bring back Indian students to attend this school, um, you know uh, I'm traveling and if you come across any Native students, so Fort Lewis always had a challenging time first even getting uh, Southern Ute students to attend Fort Lewis, 
And once that proved difficult, then Fort Lewis got creative about how it would just accept um, any Native student then. Um, so you have students who are coming from the Navajo Reservation, um, students who were from the Hopi villages, uh, Zuni, uh, of course, I mentioned Apache students as well, and uh, even some California Native students um, and students from Arizona were were part of the school. And so I think by default, um, the school accepted uh, uh, a diversity of Native students and that uh, parents too also could send and choose to elect to send their child to Fort Lewis Indian School. I think that might have addressed your question. Um, yeah, so not a formal selection process there, um, but really, um, the superintendent making all efforts to always be recruiting students um, and trying just simply to fill up the school to capacity. Um, in some of the later years, there's writings um, where uh, it's noted that Fort Lewis was a complete failure, that it had failed to, um, to uh, have consistent enrollment and even to um, be at capacity. It always struggled um, to fill its uh, seats. So there are a few questions about um, research or suggestions for future uh, learning for some of our audience members. A question generally about are there, do you have any book recommendations? Uh, another more specific question, ask, question asking if there are, if there's research or documents that describe the trauma of children who attended the Indian schools um, and or documentation of how families um, who are fragmented may have been impacted. Mm -hmm. Um, I would cite the work of David Wallace Adams, um, Education for Extinction. Um, one, his book is kind of a seminal text um, if one wants to really uh, study and understand uh, Indian boarding schools. Uh, his book um, uh, lays out both those, those negative aspects, that trauma um, that you were uh, speaking of or writing of in your comments but also students who had positive experiences. And so David Wallace Adams really does try to present both sides of the picture and suggest that um, students um, also uh, um, had positive experiences at uh, Indian school. Um, so that would be a, a starting point I would suggest. Uh, again, Education for Extinction by David Wallace Adams. Dr. Boxer, you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation the um, erasure of this history by uh, the college or the university. Are there efforts underway to um, really bring more light and awareness of the history in the campus community? There have been uh, really uh, monumental efforts um, in the last two years under our new president, um, President Stridicus, to reconcile this Indian boarding school uh, history and legacy with our, um, our, our institution today. Uh, one of the ways that uh, President Stridicus is going about this is by re-examining some um, old panels at the clock tower. Um, these panels uh, really uh, give a very, very abbreviated history of Fort Lewis as an Indian school, as a high school, as a um, A and M um, a junior college, and then finally as the four-year institution. So these panels right now are going to be removed from the clock tower, and there will be um, a process then to replace them. And um, it hasn't yet been decided, you know, what goes up in in place of those panels. Um, how you know the question though is how can the college uh, present this history in a way that acknowledges that the legacy of Fort Lewis Indian School is that for Native students, um, you know, how can they attend school and not really uh, revisit or relive that trauma um, from Indian school days? Um, and so that's one of the things that the college is doing uh, today. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bob. Boxer, I think we are close to time here, mm -hmm. but again, I want to thank you for spending uh, the evening with us and sharing your insight and wisdom and research 
uh, with our audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully at some point, we talked about this, we would love to have you at one or more of our mm -hmm. sites in the future for future collaboration. Um, oh, absolutely. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. We again want to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo and all of our donors for supporting public programming at History Colorado Community Museums. As we mentioned, you can contribute to our Borderlands project at coloradogives.org. Thank you for joining us and have a great evening.